Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Christy Truesdale, Deputy Director of the Children's Environmental Health Network. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar, Establishing a Connected and Vibrant Children's Environmental Health Community. This is the second webinar of our five-part series, Protecting Children's Environmental Health, the Blueprint in Action. Please make sure to join us for the uh, three remaining webinars in the coming months to learn about some of the achievements and incredible efforts underway to comprehensively address children's environmental health in the United States. Before we get started, I'm going to address just a few logistical items. Uh, first of all, hopefully uh, you are all able to view the slides from today's presentations through the ReadyTalk webinar plugin on your computer using the link that was provided to you uh, in your registration confirmation email. Uh, secondly, in order to hear the presentations, uh, you must be dialing in on a phone line. Uh, there's no web audio access. And the number and code are shown on this first slide um, and are also in the chat box for those who might dial in late. All lines are going to be muted and will remain muted throughout the presentations except for our presenters. Uh, but you may submit questions at any time using the chat box on the lower left side of your screen. And uh, we will be um, making some time after each presentation to handle some questions then and we'll do our very best to answer as many um, as we can. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived on the Children's Environmental Health Network website by tomorrow for uh, your future use and sharing, and the link will be shared with all of you. So I encourage uh, you to expand the conversation during this webinar, sharing what you are learning um, online, um, maybe on Twitter using the hashtag uh, children at the center. And lastly, uh, we will be emailing you, and I believe it's also going to pop up on the screen, a, um, a post-webinar um, survey link. Um, please take a minute to complete this survey so that we can use your feedback to help make uh, this webinar series as meaningful and as helpful as possible. So with that, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this webinar, uh, Nsedu Obet Witherspoon. Ms. Witherspoon is the Executive Director of the Children's Environmental Health Network, where she organizes, leads, and manages policy, education, and training, and science-related programs. For the past 19 years, she has been a leader in the field of children's environmental health serving as a past member of the NIH Council of Councils, on the Science Advisory Board for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and the External Science Board for the Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes NIH research work. She is a co-leader for advancing the Science Health Initiative of the National Collaborative on a Cancer-Free Economy Network. Ms. Witherspoon is also a board member for the Pesticide Action Network of North America, the Environmental Integrity Project, and serves on the Maryland Children's Environmental Health Advisory Council. And say, Hi there. Good afternoon. Good morning to many of you, and thank you for taking your time out um, on this end of May uh, day to join us for this great conversation. We're so excited about these two wonderful presenters uh, that I'll be introducing in just a moment. Uh, for those of you that are just joining our webinar series for the first time, this is our second this year. We will have at least two more for the rest of the calendar year, and this is all part of our efforts at the Children's Environmental Health Network to advance the field of work in, in children's health protection and to continue to grow this movement that we've established around the children's, again, children at the center and putting children at the focus point um, and ahead of all that we do in decision making and policy setting and, and uh, education and training. Uh, so we have taken on a role to, uh, which is the title of this webinar, to establish a, con a connected and vibrant children's environmental health community, not that there hasn't already been one, but to further 
solidify, break down silos, integrate and strengthen and leverage our collective work because I think if we all understand the health outcomes that we are facing and looking at and working against each and every day, um, we know that we need to do more. We need to uh, amp up. We need to further prioritize. We need to narrow in. We need to be as effective as possible. So our two presenters here uh, were uh, hand-picked and selected because we think they've got a great set of stories and case examples to share with all of you. Uh, we first have Katie Huffling, who is a great colleague and friend of the network, and she's the Executive Director of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. Katie is a certified nurse midwife and is the Executive Director of the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. Uh, she works with nurses and national nursing organizations on a variety of environmental health issues, including climate change, chemical policy, inclusion of environmental health into nursing education, and sustainable health care. Ms. Huffling was an editor of the Environmental Health e-textbook titled Environmental Health in Nursing that won the 2017 American Journal of Nurses Nursing Book of the Year in Environmental Health, and she was also the recipient of the 2018 Charlotte Brody Award, which recognizes nurses who go beyond everyday nursing endeavors to proactively promote and protect environmental health. Very excited to have you, Katie. And then we also have Jessica Rose Malam, excited to have yet another wonderful partner, Senior Health Policy Manager at Child Care Aware of America. And we've been working with Child Care Aware of America in particular through our Eco Healthy Child Care Program for many, many years now. So another solid, wonderful partner out there. Jessica joined Child Care Aware of America in October 2017 as Senior Health Policy Manager. She uses research, policy, and practice tools to advocate for all children to grow up healthy. She has a Bachelor's of Science in Biopsychology from Tufts University and an MA in Social Service Administration from the University of Chicago. And I also uh, want to make sure that I thank uh, Christy Truesdale, our Deputy Director at the Children's Environmental Health Network, who is always the incredible uh, worker bee uh, behind all of these uh, webinars and ensuring that everything is working appropriately and getting our, our uh, speakers all ready to go. So thank you, Christy, for that continued wonderful support. So let's go ahead and move forward uh, with Katie. Thank you so much. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Great. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to have all of you on with us this afternoon. And thank you for the Children's Environmental Health Network for this um, invitation and great opportunity. Um, here at the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, um, you know, protecting children's health is definitely a core part of our work and our mission. Um, and so we love working with um, partners like these to advance children's environmental health. The next first slide, please. Katie, my apologies. Could you speak a little louder? I think some folks are having a hard time hearing you. Thank you. Okay. Is this better? Yes, thank you. Ah, sorry about that. Um, so just to give you um, a little information about the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, we're the only national nursing organization that focuses on the intersection of health and the environment. And uh, we work with uh, nurses, nursing organizations, other environmental health groups around the country um, to help promote healthy environments for everyone. Um, and if you're a nurse on this call and you're not part of the Alliance, we'd love to have you join. It's, we're free to join and we um, are really fun to work with. So welcome. Next slide, please. Just to provide a little context of why working on children's environmental health is so important, uh, we believe that the environment can be defined as the world anywhere you are. So it's not just you know, being outside playing like these kiddos are, uh, but, you know, for kids, it's the school environment or the child care setting, their home environment. Um, I'm a nurse midwife, so I always think of it as uh, the mom is the baby's first environment. Um, so really looking at all of those different places where we live, work, and play uh, is really important in protecting the health of our children. Next slide. And then environmental health, um, really to contextualize that, is um, 
being able to be free from the harms of environmental exposures. You know, our children shouldn't have to get uh, be exposed to toxic chemicals that could give them asthma or um, lead that could um, impact their developing brains and nervous systems. And so this is the work that um, our organization focuses on. Next slide. And I included this just to highlight how um, significant environmental exposures can be to the health of our children. I mean, I think that um, there's so many opportunities for us um, to be able to prevent illnesses in our children just by looking at environmental exposures. Um, and when you see that a third of all disease in children um, is connected to environmental exposures, it's such an amazing opportunity to have healthier, stronger kids and um, you know, more productive lives as they age. Next slide. And, you know, it's important to focus on children a little bit separately from adults or uh, from pregnant women uh, because children aren't little adults. They drink a lot more water for body mass. They eat a lot more food. They breathe a lot more air because they're breathing more rapidly. Um, and so when we look at where exposures are occurring, we really need to be looking at um, the physiology of children. Um, also, the way that they, um, you know, play and live is very different from adults. They're on the ground, they're um, putting their hands into their mouths, and so the roots of exposures can be different than in adults. So, um, you know, as we're looking at roots of exposure and how we're addressing um, different chemicals or um, environmental hazards, we really need to be looking um, at children a little bit differently than adults. Next slide. So my organization, uh, a lot of what we do is around advocacy, and I really like to think of this as um, another form of caring. Um, nurses, are, throughout our training, we're taught to be strong advocates for our patients. You know, if any of you have ever been in the hospital, you know that the nurses are always advocating for the best possible care. Uh, but then when we can take that advocacy out of the healthcare setting and into the broader policy realm, there's an opportunity to make even uh, greater changes. And so um, today in my presentation, I have a number of examples where um, we've worked in coalitions and collaboratively uh, in the advocacy realm to make um, some significant policy change that can impact children's health. Uh, next slide. So I think one important thing to remember is that um, when we're working in environmental health, it's so important to work collaboratively. These can be really big issues, and when we work together, we're able to make um, some pretty incredible change. And these are just some of the organizations who all work together. Um, Clean and Healthy New York is a great organization based in New York who does a lot of work around childcare. And, and toxic exposures, and then Moms Clean Air Force um, working on clean air for kids. Next slide. So one of the first advocacy campaigns that I worked on um, with the Alliance of Nurses was around uh, safer chemicals. Uh, if you didn't know, uh, the Toxic Substances Control Act um, which was passed in the 1970s, was one of the only uh, major environmental laws that hadn't been updated. It was really ineffective, and um, because it was so ineffective that many of the um, chemicals that are in everyday products haven't been tested for safety, and um, the EPA did not have the um, regulatory power in order to get um, toxic chemicals taken off the market. And so uh, the Alliance of Nurses worked with a coalition called uh, Safer Chemicals Healthy Families, and it ended up being a coalition of over 400 different organizations uh, working together to uh, pass a new bill to um, update the Toxic Substances Control Act. Um, and so we got to do lots of really fun projects with uh, moms and kids uh, around this to really elevate the message of, that we needed safer chemicals. 
for the health of our children. Um, so a couple of events that we did um, were these stroller brigade events. So we had nurses, moms, kids in strollers, um, walking through the Capitol, highlighting that we needed um, safer chemicals for the health of our children. Um, the photo on the left there is um, at one of these events. Uh, I'm sorry that the uh, photo is so small, but that's um, Dick Durbin, um, Senator Dick Durbin in front there. And so it was really great going through the halls of Congress um, with moms and families and dads um, talking about how we needed safer chemicals for the health of our kids. Uh, we've also done some market campaigns um, since then. Uh, we did pass a bill that was um, okay. It wasn't exactly what we wanted, but it does. it is better. Um, and so we're keeping an eye on EPA to make sure that they are um, putting in place the most protective regulations and being as protective as possible as they're looking at chemicals. Um, but in the meantime, we're also doing these market campaigns, which are really fun and really effective, um, where we're asking um, grocery stores, dollar stores, um, different um, product producers to get toxic chemicals out of their products that they're selling. Um, so the middle picture there is um, some product testing that we did around um, can lining. So bisphenol A typically been used in can linings, now they've been um, changing that to um, similar chemicals um, that can have also um, health impacts. We're very concerned um, with exposures in children with the, with the can linings. Um, and so protesting in front of grocery stores, and that's a nurse in the middle there. Um, so this has been really effective and um, a great way to work in coalitions um, to make positive change. Next slide. We're also, along with the Children's Environmental Health Network, part of a new coalition called Clean Water for All. Um, until I started working in this coalition, I, I thought that I knew about clean water and you know how important it is for health. And what I didn't realize was just how how many significant challenges we face here in the United States with clean water. And, you know, as we saw with the crisis in Flint, Michigan, and as we're seeing in other communities around the country, um, there are a lot of children. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm at my mother's house, and she has a little barky dog. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so uh, the, um, you know, as we're seeing with, with Flint and some of these other places, um, you know, there's a lot of children that don't have access to clean water. Um, and so working, again, in co broad coalition to address these clean water issues. So when you've got um, environmental health groups, health groups, um, environmental organizations all working together, again, that's how we can start to um, build momentum and to bring change. Next slide. Um, these are some of my um, most fun events. Um, these pictures here are um, from the plans that Moms Clean Air Force has been doing the past few years um, to address climate change and to show that families are concerned about air pollution and clean air for kids. Um, and that, again, that um, families and nurses combination has been um, a, a really winning combination. Uh, so these plans started um, a few years ago where um, one of the moms had the idea they were like, kids can't sit still for a sit-in, that they could have a plan. And so um, we do it on the lawn out on Capitol Hill and um, then go and meet with our elected officials. Um, and so a few years in a row, we were able to hold um, workshops for nurses at the same time. So we'd then have the nurses and scrubs with the kids and parents um, in their red shirts from Moms Clean Air Force, um, again, going to meet with their senators um, and Congress people about climate change and how it's impacting health. 
Um, you know, kids are especially vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, whether it's from air pollution, um, extreme heat waves, um, you know, and kids are going to be feeling these effects as climate change worsens if we don't take action now. Um, so again, it's a really great combination working uh, collaboratively to address climate change. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a great tool that we developed with Moms Clean Air Force. Um, you can download it on the Moms Clean Air Force website. Uh, and, and what we did was we created this brochure to um, have parents bring with them when they go to see their pediatrician and to hand it to the pediatrician and say, climate change is impacting our children's health and we'd like you to start talking about it. Um, we give tips on how pediatricians can um, talk with their, their patients about climate change and to do it in a way that doesn't feel um, like it could, it could just because climate change, depending on you know, your patient population, it may still be a little more controversial. So to take that controversial feeling out of it um, and to make it something that can smoothly um, be starting to be used by providers as they're talking with their patients about healthy lifestyles, how to manage asthma, that type of thing. Next slide. Um, and then after we've been doing those uh, plans for a few years, um, we actually were recognized at the White House um, and were invited to hold a roundtable with them with nurses um, from many of the major nursing organizations to talk about how nurses um, can work on climate change and health. So it's really exciting to see um, our policymakers uh, really sitting up and listening to nurses and recognizing that we do have such a strong role to play in addressing climate change. With um, over 4 million nurses here in the United States, if we can even get a fraction of nurses addressing these, this critical issue, we can make um, really significant change. Next slide. And so some of the things that we've been working on after that um, historic event at the, the White House um, was things like policy statements by um, national nursing organizations. These are really helpful and to drive um, engagement by both the organizations and their members to drive policy activities, um, how active they are in the legislative realm around these different environmental health issues. And so this is an example of one that uh, we helped write and was passed uh, about a year and a half ago. The American College is basically looking at how climate change is impacting maternal, fetal, and infant health. Next slide. And these are some of the nursing organizations that are part of a new collaborative that we're forming, um, we are, have formed. Um, we're really trying to get that collective, again, that collaborative teamwork uh, to address the significant problems. So we have a few more on that aren't on here. You um, have more sign up if I made the slide. But again, um, as we're talking about climate change and health, I think that one of the most compelling issues is talking about how it is. we all want um, our kids to grow up healthy and safe. And so when we look at climate health impacts, I feel like it's just so compelling, um, both as policymakers and the public. Uh, next slide. Is this better? Um, so we, on um, just a couple weeks ago, we were really thrilled at the reception for this historic um, 116th Congress. We have the most number of women in Congress ever, so that was really exciting. And uh, my organization, along with my Moms Clean Air Force, were the key sponsors, and then we had a number of partners, which is why I wanted to highlight this. Um, 
was so amazing. We had Children's Environmental Health Network, Healthy Schools Network, um, Association of Women's Health, Obstetric and Neonatal Nurses, School Nurses. It was just fabulous um, coming together to celebrate these women. And um, we had about 10 of the Congresswomen come and give um, short remarks. And it really made me hopeful um, for children's health moving forward. They um, are very passionate about it. Uh, we have the first pediatrician congresswoman in, um, in the history of, um, so it, it's very exciting to have um, these women that really get children's environmental health and will be pushing for health protective policies. Um, so if you're in one of the, their districts, I'd highly recommend reaching out to them um, and talking to them about your concerns about children's environmental health. I think they'd be very receptive. Next slide. And that's it. Um, thank you all so much for having me here today. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Katie. You did great, as usual. And, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to say. But uh, we hope that that has encouraged some of you to check out you know, our partner here, the Lions of Nurses for a Healthy Environment, and dig a little deeper into the great work that they are doing across the country and aligning our nursing professionals and training and educating them as well as mobilizing them for all of our collective benefit and in particular vulnerable populations like children. So thank you, Katie. We do have Thanks a couple questions me. here and by all means if you have any other quick ones, type them in quick because we're going to move on to our next wonderful presenter. Um, one question from Caitlin is, how is the Alliance able to balance working on the ground in the work setting while also working in the field of advocacy as both are strenuous fields of work? Definitely. I mean, <laughs> it's a constant challenge, I think. Um, I think that, at, you know, as health professionals, I think we um, can definitely see how to incorporate it into our healthcare practice, whether it's talking with our patients or colleagues about it. Um, so I think that that's one way to do that within the healthcare setting. Um, but then I think it's a matter of um, looking at what your particular passions and priorities are and um, focusing on those. It's easy to get spread too thin. Um, you know, there's just so many different issues that all of us could be working on. And so I would say, you know, to prevent burnout, finding that one or two issues, you know, that you feel really passionately about and, and you know, and really focus your energies there so you don't get burnt out. Um, but I think it's, it's, it can be a bit, all of us um, <laughs> are constantly working on that <laughs> to find that balance. For sure. <laughs> Thank you. And another question uh, from Caitlin is, what more should government, governmental public health agencies do with their roles or influences when it comes to positively addressing and implementing child health and family environmental health policy, specifically in assisting nurses on the ground with advocacy and policy? So there's a couple attributes to unpack there. Yeah. Um, well, you know, um, to give an example of um, how some of these agencies have, you know, we we work um, we've worked closely with EPA for a number of years. Um, you know, they're currently in a more challenging political climate, um, but prior to that, um, we had signed a memorandum of understanding so that we could support EPA in reaching out to nurses, and they could provide us with some of the contact expertise and you know their reach. Um, so there's ways, I think, that we can think creatively um, on how we can um, leverage each other's skills and, um, and where we're, you know, where our strengths are. Um, I think that, that there's definitely lots more opportunities. Um, I think that um, depending on um, where agencies are located, I think some of them feel more comfortable speaking out a little more strongly than it in other areas, um, you know, so I think it's, it, it's a matter of having policymakers, you know, recognize that we need them to be putting children's health at the forefront, but that needs to be a key area of focus. So again, I think having that um, public engagement around it 
um, it's really important for them to make that a, a focus. Yep. Thank you. And I mean, the congressional event that you just talked about, you know, it's, it's, I think it's rare we've seen where instead of um, criticizing at times policy leaders or other community leaders for maybe what they're not doing, it's very important that in this field in particular, because burnout is extremely uh, prevalent and real mm -hmm. um, because you have so many energetic, uh, passionate folks. And at the end of the day, who wants to be on the wrong side of protecting kids, you know, exactly. logically speaking. <laughs> but at the, the downside of that can totally be you put yourself out there and, you know, you uh, unfortunately or fortunately make yourself uh, a target uh, for various critiques, which are at times ridiculous, but nonetheless, they are there. And it just consumes your time to potentially be addressing and having to potentially react to them. So that congressional um, event recently that just uplifted and supported and just thanked women of Congress was awesome. And I personally think we need more of that, and we need to do more of that within our field as well as as we're bridging and, and bringing in more um, and expanding our table, if you will. So. Thank you. And those of you, you know, you guys don't know, I just want to thank Katie again. She had to make an emergency trip uh, to a totally different state um, and still somehow, like Superwoman, made it uh, her way to get on this uh, webinar and present uh, so eloquently to us. So thank you again for all that you've done. And thank best so of much. luck with everything. <laughs> Thanks. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And now we'll move on to Jessica. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Um, so hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to join the conversation today. In a lot of ways, the work that Child Care Aware of America has been able to do with the Children's Environmental Health Network and other partners really highlights the value of a connected and vibrant children's environmental health community. Um, so I look forward to sharing our experiences with you. I'd like to start off with just some level setting about what child care is and how it differs from other early, early care and education programs. It's really important to understand these differences because the ways that programs are regulated and resourced really affects how they interact with other sectors and the challenges that they face when it comes to environmental health and safety. So when we talk about the early care and edu education system, we're really talking about the three subsystems that you see here. Early Head Start and Head Start are federally funded and locally operated, and they're designed to serve children from birth to five from low-income families. These programs usually have to be licensed by the state, and they also have to follow federal performance standards. Um, state pre-K programs on the other side um, differ state to state, but they're usually funded through the state's Department of Education and administered by school districts. They serve four and sometimes three-year-olds, and they're often exempt from state licensing requirements, but have their own standards and regulations designated by the state education department. Child care, which is the area that I'll focus on today, is what we usually think of as daycare or preschool. And it includes private, for-profit, and nonprofit child care centers and family child care homes serving kids from birth through school age. Um, and all states require at least some child care providers to be licensed, but most states have exemptions for faith-based providers, or providers just serving a couple of kids, um, and sometimes for other groups as well. For child care, the major national program that addresses health and safety is the Child Care and Development Block Grant, or CCDBG. It's the main source of federal funding for child care subsidies, and in a lot of ways it dictates how states think about child care supply, health, safety, and quality. It's important to note CCDBG has no requirements on environmental health testing, leaving it to states to determine what's best. It does reference a guide called Caring for Our Children Basics as a place for states to start. Basics represents the minimum health and safety standards that experts believe should be in place where children are cared for outside of their homes. It includes standards on staffing, program activities, facilities, health and safety, including a standard for an environmental health audit of child care sites. The recommended audit includes assessments of potential air, soil, and water contamination, hazardous materials in building construction, and potential safety hazards in the surrounding community. Again, this is a recommended standard, but not a requirement. And we've yet to find a single state that has a broad-based policy that checks all of the boxes from that environmental health audit standard. Most states have licensing requirements that aim to limit children's exposure to some harmful chemicals. 
although they vary quite a bit in terms of their scope and their specificity. These regulations can also differ between center-based programs and home-based programs. I'll just go through a couple of examples that demonstrate that variability. Um, according to a 2015 policy review by the Environmental Law Institute and Children's Environmental Health Network, all states prohibit or restrict smoking at child care facilities in some way, though only a few of them prohibit smoking at all times in all types of licensed child care facilities. In contrast, just eight states had specific provisions for radon testing in child care facilities. When it comes to lead, most states have some regulations that limit exposure to lead-based paint, oftentimes requiring that some or all parts of a child care facility be maintained of uh, free or, um, sorry, free of chipped, peeling, or flaking paint. Um, in recent years, not surprisingly, thanks to Flint, many states are adopting rules around water testing for lead in child care. And about one third of states have some licensing requirement that addresses the location of child care facilities on or near potentially hazardous sites. New Jersey, which is really the leader on this, requires centers applying for new or renewed licenses to have a site inspection by the State Department of Environmental Protection to determine whether there is residual contamination from a past use of the site and certify that no further remediation is necessary. But this requirement only applies to centers and not to family child care homes. So as you can tell, childcare is a really diverse and complicated system for providers, for policymakers, and for parents to navigate. There are more than 400 state and local childcare resource and referral agencies nationwide that work with communities to support that complicated system. CCRNRs play a uniquely central role in the childcare system, making them critical partners for any initiatives that aim to improve the health and well-being of young children. They serve working families by providing child care referrals and other important information about how to identify, access, and afford child care. They work directly with child care providers by offering trainings, technical assistance, and connections to resources that can help them run more successful businesses. CCRNRs are often responsible for helping child care providers meet state and local requirements, um, and they're key to helping with policy implementation. And CCRNRs can advocate for state and local policies that benefit young children and working families. They often also collect detailed data about supply and demand of child care, as well as contact information for child care providers. So they're really key partners to be aware of and, and involved in this process. Child Care Aware is a national membership organization for CCRNRs. Um, we support our members and the child care system by advocating for child care policies that improve the lives of children and families. We lead research that advances child care in the early learning field. We leverage technology to help families make more informed decisions about child care, and we provide some professional development to child care providers. So the last bit of background information I want to share is just our approach to health and health policy at CCAOA, which can give you an idea of how environmental health fits into what we're already doing. For much of our history, CCAOA has focused on advocating for minimum health and safety standards in child care including things like background checks, provider training, common sense regulations, and monitoring. In 2014, the Child Care and Development Block Grant was reauthorized, and I mentioned CCDBG a little earlier. It's uh, the bill that funds child care subsidies and guides states on how to think about health and safety. With 2014 reauthorization, much of what we'd been advocating for was included, and that was a huge win. But it also meant we had to quickly switch gears and focus how, on how to best support states and our members in implementing the new requirements. With those minimum requirements finally codified, we now have the opportunity to explore some new areas of health and child care. So this slide just shows the four big buckets of health topics that CCAOA thinks about now. Safety in the environment covers some of the traditional health and safety topics like injury prevention or safe sleep, as well as, as, well as other elements of environmental health like air and water quality. Nutrition, breastfeed, the active place, screen time, those are some of our core areas of health promotion. And then the last bucket is inclusion, covering kids with disabilities, special health care needs, as well as mental and behavioral health. Our health policy team is working on projects across all of these issue areas to support responsible policy making and help child care providers make their programs healthier for kids. Okay, now that I've set the background and you're clear on what child care is and what resource and referral agencies are, I'm really excited to dive in and talk more specifically about what we've been doing to promote environmental health and child care. As I mentioned, it's just in the last couple of years that we've had the organizational capacity to start thinking about and working in environmental health. 
we're really focused on bringing the issue of environmental health to the attention of our members and to the child care field and helping them see what their role can and should be. It's been an incremental process, but we really are starting to gain momentum and we're really excited to see where things go. So our first strategy has really been recognizing that while we're experts in child care, we're not yet experts in environmental health. So as much as possible, we've tried to correct, connect our members and networks with the national experts in the field, like the Children's Environmental Health Network. They have presented at our biannual symposium, and we've had several opportunities to co-host and cross-promote webinars. I think this is actually the third webinar we've been on together in the last two or three months, um, which is a lot of fun. We have also worked really hard to share social media posts and use that children at the center hashtag to keep our members connected to the children's environmental health movement. And I think it's important for our members to see that environmental health is a priority for their national organization and have the opportunity to interact directly and ask questions of the experts in the environmental health field. Another approach that we've taken, um, which has come out of our partnership with CHN, is to promote their EcoHealthy Child Care endorsement and resources among our members. If you're not familiar with it, EcoHealthy Child Care is a voluntary program by which child care providers can be recognized for following environmentally healthy practices and policies. From our side, we see CCRNRs as a great potential ambassador for the program through their work with families and providers. So we've shared information about EcoHealthy Child Care through our social media and publications whenever we have the opportunity to. And we also sit on the EcoHealthy Child Care National Advisory Committee to help them craft resources and strategies that really fit the needs of providers and of CCRNRs. Another fairly small but meaningful thing that we've done recently is to build environmental health into the resources that we've developed for parents. So we provide checklists for parents that they can bring with them when they're visiting child care programs or thinking about whether to enroll their kids there. Just recently, we added several questions and tips about environmental health to those checklists. Um, I've included just a couple of examples here about facility testing and using cold water to minimize lead exposure. We know that parents use these checklists from our website, and we also know that our members distribute them as is or use them as a template for their own quality checklist. So again, another simple way of getting the information out there to our members. We recently published uh, an ebook that covers four environmental health topics and gives CCRNRs some concrete steps that they can take to promote environmental health in child care. Like the child care checklist, the ebook really highlights the work that CCRNRs are already doing and raises up opportunities to build environmental health tips and topics into that current work. Our health policy team does a fair amount of policy analysis and technical assistance with our members and states to help them think through policy solutions that promote healthy development for all kids in child care. When we do this policy work, including work around state environmental health policies, we always approach it through an equity and practice-based lens. We ask questions like, what do policies for lead testing or safe siting really mean for child care providers? Are there providers who are disproportionately impacted by the problem or systematically disadvantaged by the proposed solution? And what supports will providers need in order to implement the policies? When we make policy recommendations about health topics, including environmental health, we try to push our members and partners to consider the unintended consequences and what providers will really need in order to put those new policies into practice. All the strategies that I've described so far may seem pretty small, but they all add up to our ultimate goal, which is really to change the way that child care providers, parents, CCRNRs, and policymakers think about and practice health and safety in child care. Historically, safety in child care has focused on hazards that we can easily observe. Are there working smoke detectors? Are kids kept away from the kitchen or away from hot pots? We can see those hazards. We know that they're unsafe. But what if there's lead in the drinking water? You can't see that. Or the exhaust or fumes coming from a busy road outside. Those hazards are just as important to be aware of and manage, so we want people to pay attention to them. And health and child care has also been framed in a pretty narrow way historically. We think about things like washing hands or sending kids home when they have pink eye or strep throat, but we haven't spent as much time thinking about how toxins in the air, water, soil might affect their developing bodies and impact their lifelong health.
So I've given you a couple of examples of the steps that we're taking to promote environmental health in child care, and now I just want to share some of the successes we've experienced and lessons that we've learned along the way. As I mentioned, we've taken a pretty incremental approach to this work. Um, in a lot of ways, it's something that feels quite new for CCRNRs and for the child care field. Um, they're stretched in a lot of different directions, so introducing anything new can be a real challenge. But we're starting to build some interest and some momentum, and we've already had a great response to that ebook that we put out. We had over 200 people register for our safe sighting webinar that we did back in April. Um, and that is it's a way more overwhelming response than we anticipated. So we know that the interest is there um, and we're gaining momentum. Turning our attention to environmental health has also opened some really new and interesting doors for us internally um, and getting to know some other colleagues within CCAOA who we haven't worked with closely in the past. It's prompted some great conversations with colleagues from our emergency preparedness and parent family community engagement teams about how to address environmental health in childcare from a bunch of different angles. And then we've also made some great connections to new groups like the American Planning Association and the National Association of County and City Health Officials. And along with our partnership with Children's Environmental Health Network and in the spirit of creating a vibrant and connected community, we see these connections as a great opportunity to keep that momentum that we've started to keep it going. The lessons that we've learned along the way so far really have come from what we've seen and heard from the child care field. A lot of it comes down to what I said about our approach to policy, which is really focused on balancing impact and best practice with feasibility for child care practitioners. The cost of policy solutions can be extremely high, particularly the kinds of major remediation or capital improvements that can come along with environmental testing policies. It's really important to consider just how slim the margins are for child care providers and how daunting the cost of abatement or remediation can be. If we want to implement environmental health policies, we have to think about what cost providers can bear and what cost they truly cannot. Another important lesson worth sharing is that settings really matter. So as I mentioned earlier, licensing regulations often differ between centers and family child care homes. A lot of times there's a focus, both in programs and in policies, on center-based care. Since centers serve more kids than home-based providers do, investing in a single center has the potential to impact a larger number of kids than investing in single-family child care home. So it's more bang for your buck. But if we're thinking about equity and improving circumstances for the kids most at risk for health disparities, it's important to know that family child care programs are actually more likely to serve low-income families they're more likely to serve children of color, and they're more likely to serve kids with disabilities. So although focusing on family child care may be a bit more expensive or more complicated, it also has the greatest potential to impact health equity. And I've alluded to it already, but we've seen over and over again that policies aren't the, alone aren't the solution. Providers and CCRNRs really need support in order to implement those policies, both in terms of training and technical assistance, but also with funding. We have to connect environmental health rules and regulations with programs that fund remediation activities. So we make sure the rules protect all children and we make sure we don't suffer any of those unintended consequences. So as I said, we've taken an incremental approach and it just gets back to how challenging it is to change culture and change the narrative. Child care systems aren't accustomed to thinking about environmental health as part of their wheelhouse. And oftentimes, big changes in child care policy tend to be reactive, like regulations will change around safe sleep only after an infant or several infants die in care. That's how we change regulations, and it certainly shouldn't be. So with environmental health, we're asking them to be proactive because the effects of chemical exposure may not show up until a year down the road or multiple years down the road. Um, it's a slow process, um, but the response we've gotten to most of our strategies has been overwhelmingly positive. So we're continuing to share the, spread the word and share the message, um, but we're prepared for a long road ahead. And as you can see, we're really just getting started on integrating environmental health into the child care field in a thoughtful and meaningful way. And that makes a connected children's environmental health community even more vital. 
sense, we need to be able to partner with folks in other fields to figure out what solutions make sense in child care. Child care inherently cuts across sectors. It's an educational space, it's a health promotion space, a small business, it's a workplace, and it's a critical support for the entire economy. And when leaders in healthcare, education, business, and child care are part of a connected movement, we can align our messages that we're sharing with families about environmental health and speak with one voice. And bringing child care and specifically resource and referral agencies into the environmental health conversation creates opportunities for collaboration and for innovation that make sure kids are healthy wherever they live, learn, and play. So thank you so much for inviting me, um, giving me a chance to learn from Katie and um, to share what we've been up to. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Jessica. Very informative and uh, pretty exciting to see where <coughs> where all this work has continued, where it started, quite frankly, and where it's continued to grow. And one of my questions is, I mean, there's so much that you all are already kind of balancing right now. Um, any indications of where some of your priority areas um, either will continue to be or any new horizons that you see in this realm that you all have been discussing that you're able to, to bring up at this time into the future? as far as your um, focused area of activity? Yeah, I think at this point it's without an external source of funding to focus on environmental health, it's going to continue to be um, a drum that we beat persistently but not that hard, if, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yes. We're going to try to sneak it into every conversation that we have, all of our health work, um, you know, considering the environmental health uh, angle of all of our health work. But at this point, um, it's saying yes to every opportunity we have to present on webinars or participate in advisory panels. Um, we are deeply committed to continuing to being part of this work and getting our members more on board with this work. Um, but it is, it's not a funded area for us, so that makes, um, you know, really pushing things forward a little bit harder. Yep. No, can very much appreciate that. And we didn't even we didn't even position that officially, but I'm so glad you answered that that way because uh, it's the elephant in the room many times. It's not the only, and I'm in many conversations on collaborations, uh, for example, around water, where I have colleagues that believe that, um, yes, funding and capacity is an issue, but it's not the only biggest issue where some might say, hey, if we just had more support and funding. But the reality is, all of us out here still need a lot more capacity, um, you know, to do uh, and implement and engage and extend our partnership and to be genuine about bridging the science and translating the science effectively into action meaningful for whatever group you're working with at that time, including individual community members, right, So, or child care professionals and all the above. So really appreciate that answer. Another question for you is, um, do you all have a different approach to outreach in regards to family child providers versus center-based child care? Yeah, so it's um, it's not a simple yes or no. I think our so so much of our work is um, is through our members, and they certainly approach things um, with family child care differently than they do with centers. Um, I would say. On the national level, we try really hard to think about what implementation or um, what the implications are in the different settings. So while we may not be speaking separately to, to center-based providers versus family child care, we try to develop resources that are all-encompassing of all settings or recognize when something that's all-encompassing isn't appropriate and we really do need to tease out um, specific standards or specific recommendations for the different settings. So I don't know if that answers the question, but no, we, yeah. we try to yeah, we try to be cognizant of, of how the different context does affect um, what providers are able to do. Excellent. Well thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, there's one question here that I guess I'll take the purview of the moderator to help try to answer um, what other fields should embrace children's environmental health and join the quote unquote community that haven't already done so. So it's a running list because, you know, almost 30 some years ago when this field uh, and the children's environmental health was right there, really emerged and was launched, at that time it was healthcare professionals, our nursing professionals, 
uh, eventually it became our researchers, a little bit more expanded our policy leaders, agricultural leaders, community leaders, e environmental justice. But what we have learned here, uh, the Children's Environmental Health Network worked very hard and with many partners out there in 2015 to launch a blueprint for protecting children's environmental health, and that is available free on our website. We do encourage you to check it out. That is how we started framing these educational forums among many different ways that many of you in the field could, could bite off a chunk of work if you're so looking for how to help streamline and prioritize uh, and um, try to narrow in some of your uh, collective work according to the capacity you have or are trying to obtain. And uh, what we did learn in that process and even since then is that we are very much in need of um, engineers, city planners, social scientists, health economists, youth. Um, can't emphasize that more than enough. Many of you are aware that a lot of our um, efforts emerging um, across the country and even worldwide are very much led by um, and orchestrated by and have creative design by our youth. Um, and it's extremely important for us to be listening and learning and also um, engaging on the energy and creativity uh, that they have, and if you will, n n renewed spirit that they have um, um, to uh, conquer, whether it's climate change or, or many related environmental health and beyond issues. I would also throw in uh, communication experts, because what we've also learned in public health, environmental health, and children's environmental health for sure is that there are a lot of great resources out there. You've heard of many today. Um, we, the Children's Environmental Health Network, are very proud of many of our resources and, and on and on related to our partners. But the reality is many of our resources, even in the best of intentions, still are not getting to the communities that need them the most in order to act, be best informed, make better judgment calls, better um, some behavior changes, even if they're baby steps, and certainly other influential leaders in our communities. So we have to constantly be challenging ourselves, all of us, including the Children's Environmental Health Network, which we try to do every day. How can we do this better? How have we learned from uh, other attempts? Uh, how can we uh, better partner, engage? You know, the message is just as important as the messenger. So these are just some of the, um, I guess, additional stakeholders, other partners, community voices, leaders that um, – at minimum, <laughs> and we could go on and on, would be extremely beneficial just by notion of who they are, the work they're doing, and what they can lend into this broader field of protecting kids. So with that, uh, again, we will thank all of you for your time, and unless there are any other questions posted here, oh, there is one. Oh, just a thank you. Okay, oh, there is one. There's a few. Where does the current funding come from? So uh, they didn't stress who this is to. Um, I don't know if Jessica, is, do you um, want to speak to any of your current funders if you're able to do that for some of the work that you are able to conduct? Yeah, so we've, we've been fortunate to have, um, we, we have yet to have environmental health uh, projects funded externally, but we do have funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, from the American Heart Association, um, and we're funded um, as a lead on the National Center for Early Childhood Health and Wellness. Um, and through all of those things, again, we've been able to make connections in the environmental health field and try to um, push things forward. But again, we haven't had any specific environmental health funding. So if anybody knows of environmental health funding that's interested in child care and wants to talk to me, my contact information is there. Thank you. And final question for you, Jessica. Uh, it seems there's a lot of opportunity in the area of early childhood education and sustainability. How do you feel environmental health and child care bridges into that study arena, if at all? You know, I, I think it certainly does. Um, again, the child care field has been pretty focused on survival. Um, and just making sure that there is funding and supports in place to make sure every child who needs child care has access to it. Um, and that has been an all-consuming task, and it's something that is not done yet. There, <laughs> there are still major gaps. So introducing anything, um, including environmental health, can be a real challenge. But I think um, something that we really say a lot is that the benefits of early childhood education are well known as far as their impacts on um, the economy and the, the health of people when they grow up and all of that. And without strong 
health foundations and environmental health foundations, you're putting all of those other benefits at risk. So um, it, it doesn't make sense to invest in child care if you're not investing in healthy child care. Mm, I love it. We could not have said it better, um, and thank you for those final words. I think very appropriate for all of this conversation. I do want to mention that Shanita Rashid on our staff actually thanks our presenters for sharing this important work and making it relatable to professionals and the public at large, and I think I'd have to agree. Um, really, again, back to our conversation about communication, how we communicate with each other and many other partners and potential partners is all um, a learning in process. And, I think that your slides and just the you know the graphics and the way that you all both of you presented I think was very meaningful and helpful to the recipients today. So thank you very much. And we have one more slide here. Just these are different ways that you can join the Children's Environmental Health Movement. We'd love to see all of you. Just take a moment and you'll learn about Children's Environmental Health Day, which is the uh, second Thursday of every October Child Health Month, which this year is October 10th. A lot of different ways that you can uh, tr track and um, include all kinds of work that you, your work, your organization, your communities are doing with and for children. We want to know about them and to be able to model them and share them across the country and different ways you can take action and uh, the way you can join our next webinar and follow us on social media. So we'd love to connect and uh, learn about different ways we can further connect it within your networks with you. Thank you all so much and enjoy the rest of your Wednesday.